Uh, today we are in a talk, uh, as you can see from the graphic up there, uh, entitled Worth Bragging. And to get us started, uh, I'm going to ask that you would turn to someone and say something. We're going to put it on the screen for you. I want you to say this to them. Some people brag way too much. Yeah. And no eye rolling, no, no adding a hmm, you know, some people hmm, you know. Well, uh, no point poking them and saying, you better listen today. Um, today I want to pose a simple question. We've been talking about it as a staff. I've been thinking about it a bit. Uh, what in my life is worth bragging about? That's an interesting question. What in my life is really worth bragging about? Uh, everyone, I think, has something worth bragging about. Uh, and I'll, I'll just be honest with you about me. This is there's been some whispering, there's been some rumors, there's been some conjecture. So I'll just go ahead and let it out of the bag. Yes, it is true. Uh, if we'll show a photo, I won the Super Bowl <laughs> back in 2011. It's true. I just don't brag about it. It's like that was a something some time back. But. Uh, I catch that Aaron Rodgers thing all the time. Uh, but in all seriousness, we all have things that we can brag about. We all have a set of accomplishments. Uh, it might be the school we went to. It might be something you did athletically, something you did business-wise. Uh, we all have some, a variety of accomplishments that we can hang our hat on and brag about. Or maybe it's an attribute. Uh, you're just simply intelligent. And, um, you know, you can co compute really complex things, and uh, you have an intelligence that's at a level higher than some people. Uh, maybe it's you're really, really good looking, and that's just an attribute that you have, and God blessed you with that. Or maybe you were born into to wealth, and you had a family that just had been successful, and that's just an attribute of your life. Or maybe you're the kind of person, one of my best friends is like this, you could drop them anywhere in the country, and inside of six months, we'll have a business going and successful. Maybe you have that skill set. Uh, maybe it's a set of experiences. But we all have a variety of things that we could, um, that we could brag about. Uh, but those things ought to lead us towards worship and gratitude. Worship of the Lord, gratitude for what he's directed us to. When it comes to bragging, when it comes to boasting, it's worth asking ourselves, what in my life really is worth bragging about? I want to give you a truth. This is an unbiased truth. That means it's an all skate for us on age, gender, our background. It doesn't matter. Bragging about the correct things is an indicator of maturity and growth. Bragging about the wrong things creates momentum towards hardship and uh, being humbled. And so people often will say, nobody likes a bragger. Well, th that's only partly true. Uh, if we brag about the correct things that I'll push into in a moment, it is an indicator of maturity and an indicator of growth. Uh, if we brag about the wrong things or selfish things, those things generate a momentum towards trouble and hardship and eventually uh, being humbled. And uh, you'll see it in your notes, but some misguided examples. The scriptures aren't limited to these. There's lots of examples. You could choose five, six, ten, and you'd be accurate. But there are a number of misguided examples of bragging. In the uh, Old Testament, you have Miriam and you have Aaron, who were uh, Moses' brother and sister. And they brag in Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 12, they kind of brag about an entitlement. They have this statement of, you know, is he the only one that God has talked to? I mean, he's talked to us too. We've heard the voice of the Lord. And, um, and it doesn't work well for them. The Lord judges them because of it. Uh, Samson, we know the story of Samson, and he was great in strength, and he bragged on his strength rather than recognizing who that actually came from. He postured around that, and it led to his uh, demise. Saul, King Saul, first king of Israel, in 1 Samuel 13 through 15, he's kind of braggadocious about his position. 
Being the king allows him to do things that he should not do, uh, is his contemplation, and it leads to his ruin. Uh, The Pharisees, they brag about their heritage. Uh, And Jesus, early on in Matthew uh, chapter 3, he pushes on something and says, you know, that uh, the father can raise a son of Abraham even out of a stone. But they felt like we are born on this heritage, we're born Jewish, that puts us above other people. And they bragged about their heritage. A rich young ruler uh, brags about his righteousness. From a kid, I've kept all these commandments. And Jesus says, there's still something you lack. And uh, he ends up going away sad because he didn't like what Jesus had to say. Uh, we can all brag about the wrong things and create momentum towards trouble and hardship and uh, being humbled. Uh, the disciples were certainly in that. And we're going to look in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 says this, in verse 46 through 48, it says, An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Now pause right there. When it uses this phrase of the greatest, it's using this idea of who holds the most value. Who's the most important here? Ongoing, if Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is going to establish a kingdom, then who is the most valuable to that process here? And there's an argument about what they brought to the table for this. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child, had him stand beside him, and he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Now, let me pause there for a second. The simple fact, don't miss the humanity of this, the simple fact that there is an argument sets the stage that they had an opinion and felt like they had evidence that supported that opinion. You and I don't argue about anything that we don't share as an opinion and feel like we have the evidence to support that opinion. If you get an argument at work, you feel like you have evidence that supports your position. If you argue with your spouse or you argue with your kids or you argue young people with your parents, you feel in your mind you have evidence to support why you're holding this position. So the disciples who get into this argument hold some kind of perspective and feel they have the evidence that supports that position. Uh, You could say that Peter's kind of saying, I've been here longer than y'all. Uh, I was one of the first ones. It was my brother Andrew, and then he comes and gets me, and then it's James, and he gets his brother John, and uh, we end up following. We were were here before any of y'all, so of course we're going to be the ones that have the evidence to support we should be ahead of y'all. Levi might say, or Matthew might say, well, I have dealt with finances, and if he's established in a kingdom then that's what's going to be needed. He's going to need me close to manage numbers or to manage things. So I think I'm probably am the most valuable in this equation. And they they all could have postured about it. But Jesus says, uh, brings a child and says, this child. Now let me insert something here. There's no getting around this. In the ancient context, as is still true in lots of cultures today, there's a class system. You could call it a caste system. A caste system is simply what you're born into. A class system is what you're going to arise to. If you were born as a Jewish man, then you were held in higher esteem than a Gentile. But it wasn't just an all skate. If you were born to a teaching family, like to a rabbi or to somebody that was a proficient student in the Torah, you were higher. And even within that, the Pharisees were higher than that. And even within the Pharisees, there's a selection that's higher than that. So there's this all kind of a pecking order that went through all these different levels of Jewish men, then down to Gentile men, and then down to the ladies, and then down to kids. Kids were at the bottom. So when Jesus grabs this kid to use this illustration, he is simply taking the person that is of the least contributors, the least value, the one who would be at the lowest of their class system. And he says, if you posture about the evidence that you think you have as to why everything is great, you're going to miss it. Rather, if you take on the position as like this kid, being the least 
you'll find that you're actually the greatest. Now, you would think if you had that kind of a talk and that kind of an illustration, and you know that you were guilty, you were suggesting things about yourself, you would think you'd learn the lesson. You would think that would not be a lesson that Jesus would have to revisit with you. And even if you thought it, you dare not say it. I mean, we all know you can think something without saying something. But you wouldn't say it in front of Jesus. But we fast forward all the way to Luke chapter 22 and it shows up again. In Luke chapter 22, the context is this before you read. The context is in verse 19. It's the Lord's Supper. It's what we just shared in, communion. It's his final meal. He's taken the bread, he's taken the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Following that, he ends up telling them this. He says, and added to that, one of you is going to betray me. It's following that statement that one of you is going to betray me that we read verse 24. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Now, you would think you would not get into a fight about posturing in front of Jesus if you've already been humbled once. Remember, it creates a momentum towards trouble, hardship, and being humbled. You would think you wouldn't do that a second time, but they do. And Jesus said to them, The king of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you're not supposed to be like this, guys. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. You remember the kid illustration? Don't go make me find another kid. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Well, that's an easy one. The one who's at the table is greater than the one who serves. We know the class system. But Jesus says, is it not the one who's at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? He's just reminding him, man, be really, 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 really cautious and careful about what you're bragging about. Really, 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 really cautious about what God entrusts you that you posture and puff your chest out about. Rather, there's a better pathway, and that is to be a servant. Now, watch what happens. This is interesting. In the midst of this, there's a breakout that happens. Jesus has a private dialogue with Peter then, Immediately following this, in verse 31, he says this, Simon, Simon, which is Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Now pause here. We talked about this last week. We talked about the reality that we live in a spiritual world in which we have a real enemy and that the enemy, the devil, will tempt, will attack. And Jesus is making no bones about it. He's saying he's asked to come after you. And then he says this, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, before the sun even comes up, this is the night he's going to be betrayed. Before the sun even gets up, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times that you even know me. Now, We can read about this also in Matthew 26, and Matthew 26 adds a little bit of extra detail to it. It says this in chapter 26, 33 through 35, Peter replied, even if all fall away, like I am the greatest here, even if everybody else falls apart, loses their way, gets fickle in their faith, I knew it. I knew they were going to, even if they all fall away. I won't. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered this very night before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. They wanted that to be true. It just wasn't. Now, in your notes, a couple things, and we'll put this on the screen. You don't have to fill anything in here. I just find this to be true, that if and when we argue for our greatness, Satan is going to leverage that naivete. Uh, He does with Peter. Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And your posturing, your bragging about the wrong things has positioned you for Satan to leverage that naivete. 
in your life as to where it came from, who's blessed you, why he's blessed you. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, it talks about if you think you're standing strong, you should be very, very cautious. Your strength doesn't come from you. Uh, the second thing, and this is an interesting thing, we are vulnerable to resisting the inside of Jesus. When we posture and we're bragging about who we are and what we've done and all this, that, and the other, and that there really, there really should be a parade for us, um, we will be vulnerable to resisting the insight of the Lord. I'll just put myself on the table here for a second. There have been times over the years that the Lord has wanted to challenge, correct, um, rebuke even times. Things in my life or me for, for a variety of things. I'm 47, been following the Lord since I was 16. There have been a number of times that the Lord has had to put me on the potter's wheel, so to say. And there have been times, I'm not proud to confess this, but there have been tr times that the Lord has used somebody to come and say, Hey, Joel, I'm really, I'm this uncomfortable, but I've got I, I to gotta challenge you on something. And when I'm posturing about something, I have been resistant to that word. When I'm walking in a place of humility, not posturing, I'm far more open to the inside of the Lord. But if I'm posturing about something, I will resist that insight. Peter resists that insight. Jesus says, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, you're going to disown me. And Peter's like, nah, you're wrong. Have you ever told Jesus he's wrong about you? Only to find out he was right. But there was something about that posturing that kept you from receiving. Begs the question, what in your life really is worth bragging about? Now, if we go back to our unbiased truth, our unbiased truth was this. Bragging about the correct things is an indicator of maturity and growth. Bragging about the wrong things creates a momentum towards being humbled. I think this is true, that bragging in one way or the other is going to generate momentum. It's going to generate momentum towards the Lord. It's going to generate momentum towards trouble. I want to give you three timeless things that are always worth bragging about. Three timeless things, and these are real simple. Jesus, your mentors, and then other Christ followers. So no matter how successful you are at work, no matter whether the kids made Dean's role, no matter what's going on in your life, whether you're facing challenges, whether you're not, three things that are always timeless and worth bragging about, first and foremost, is him. When you brag about Jesus, it generates worship and direction in your life. When you're bragging about who he is and what he's done in your life, there's worship, but there's also direction as to where I'm going, what I'm doing, why I'm even doing these things. And um, I've got a list of six things. It is not limited to this. By any means, you could probably add 10, 12 additional things and you'd be right. <coughs> but six things about his life that are worth bragging about. He lived without ever sinning. Jesus lived without any impropriety. He lived without any um, false or wrong, I should say, treatment of another person. He lived without any incongruence in his thinking or his motives. I mean, imagine that, a perfect man, never to have a wrong or false word or thought. That'd be a beautiful thing, right? To, to hold every single thought captive, to never have an errant thought or an errant word. He taught things that are still valued to this day. I mean, you go on to any school campus, you go on to any college campus, they might say that God isn't alive and they might posture all those kind of things, and yet on those same campus, you'll hear people talking about love, and you'll hear people talking about forgiveness and a kingdom divided. You'll hear people all across campuses leveraging statements from Jesus. You have politicians. I mean, I can't think of a, a presidential candidate that hasn't tried to layer into some statement out of Jesus' own words. Uh, his words are everywhere. They're still valued. They're still taught by everyone. Um, he performed unparalleled, unrivaled miracles. 
Uh, he created or he created things out of nothing, food that wasn't there. He was able to calm weather. Um, Pastor Micah talked about the heat. If I had that capacity, I promise you, we'd had cool weather weeks ago. If I was able to say, be cool. <laughs> you know? No control of weather. He had control of it. Uh, he could um, take somebody that doctors could do nothing with, and he could heal them. He could walk on water. He could defy things. Um, he raised people from the dead to deliver people from evil spirits. He did fascinating, unparalleled miracles, documented. Uh, he was accessible. He was accessible by people of all walks of life. A leper of all people could touch him. Uh, somebody who was on an outcast could have access to him. A king could have access to him. That's not true today. You can't think of just anybody you want and have access to them. Uh, Jesus made himself accessible to a dad, to a Gentile, to a sick person, to, to anyone. He defeated death. I mean, that in and of itself, worth bragging about. The resurrection, the ability to take that which is uh, ahead of every single person and to defeat it and uh, to walk in life. And then amazingly, he empowers people to walk in that victory and that freedom. He takes people and he doesn't leverage his strength against them. Instead, he empowers them. He takes somebody like a Mary Magdalene and empowers her uh, to a new, redeemed, forgiven way. He takes Thomas, who was struggling with pain as much as he was doubt, and he says, we'll do this at your pace. Come and touch. Uh, for Peter, who had, Peter couldn't even make it to the morning. He couldn't even make it to breakfast without denying. And Jesus doesn't come to him and say, ah, what you got to say now, you know? I imagine if I was the one, if I was Jesus, uh, the scriptures would have been written completely different. I would have been all, what you got to say now, foo? You know? I wouldn't even put in an L. It'd be foo. Um, but Jesus says, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Employs them into the ministry. Uses them. It's fascinating how he empowers people. Jesus is always, always always worth bragging about. So if your scenario right now, present day, November 3, 2019, is not something worth bragging about, your scenario is not Facebook worthy, so to say. You don't want to let people know the struggles your marriage is going through. You don't want to let people know the pain that you're going through. You don't want to let people know that you're not sure how to get through this. I'm telling you, he is always worth bragging about. You always have something to brag on. When you look in the New Testament, Paul would use the word boast, to boast. Um, in just a little bit of numbers, uh, Paul writes 13 letters. And in those 13 letters, of 12 of those letters, the word boast is used 20 times. In one of the other letters, 2 Corinthians, he uses boast 29 times. So you, you got to ask, what was going on with those group of people? And he uses it 25 times in chapters 10, 11, and 12. It's because they were posturing. They were posturing. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 17, but let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 18 would say, since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. Now, let me insert this. He does not want to do this. This is not Paul's way. He is not a boaster. But he says, if you are going to boast, then I'm going to boast too. And he goes into this litany of, of what qualifies him. And it's fascinating. We'll read it. It's very lengthy. He says this in verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And then he adds this. It's like he just gets real, almost like he's talking to them, but then he wants to communicate to the viewer also, I must be completely out of my mind to be doing this. Then back to the argument. He doesn't even want to do this, but he says, I am more. 
I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. Pause there for just a second. When you think that you're, you have a bad day and the Lord's letting you go through some bad stuff, just a point of reference. He's got evidence to argue he's had it worse. But he continues on. I've been in danger from rivers, been in danger from bandits, in danger from my countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Pause right there. If you were to ever say, Lord, why would you let me go through such tough things? He's headed towards it. He's going to tell you exactly why. He says, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And then verse 30 says this, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. There are times that the sovereignty of the Lord will take you to, to reveal your weakness. Because it's in his strength that our, we see uh, this perfection. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect is what Paul would go on to say. And so you say, what do I have in my life worth bragging about? It's fantastic, the accomplishments, the attributes, the achievements, all the experience, all that's great, but it's not worth bragging about. You pull back and you say, what in my life is worth bragging about? It is him, it is him, it is him. Second thing that is worth bragging about is your mentors. Gratitude and responsibility. Grateful for who God put in your life. And a responsibility to run thereafter. Uh, scripture says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you. Who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. He, he gives this statement about you need to value the ones that the Lord put in your life to spur you towards faith, to spur you towards him. I mean, honestly, did you come to know the Lord entirely on your own? Was it you that set your path and your trajectory towards him, you and you alone? Paul would say, now there are people that have been in part of that story. There have been people that are part of teaching you and helping you, and you should hold them in a high value. Uh, this is something that's been very uh, poignant for me, at the forefront for me this week, and I'll tell you why. As I look back in my early days of following the Lord, if there was a point that you'd say, it was there that Joel began to follow the Lord, it was at age 16, and there's kind of this Mount Rushmore of four individuals that were critical to that path. Uh, One's name was Gerald. We called him Taco. He was a leader of a young life, um, a, a, a campus ministry. And then there was a lady named Vicky. And then there were two pastors, two youth pastors. Pastor, youth pastor was uh, Doyle, uh, was in communication with him this week. Uh, and then Pastor Bill was in communication with him this week. Uh, Taco, as we called him, the leader of young life, was the guy that was first in my life, first one, uh, to spur me towards saying yes to Christ and coming to know him. Taco went home to be with the Lord uh, this week. He had bat battled brain cancer for some time, and, um, and he went home to be with the Lord. So this week I've been mindful of how I got here. Like, I love to stand up and teach. I do. And some of the feedback that I often will get uh, is flattering. Um, I never, I never got here on my own. There were other people that set a trajectory and a path for me. And uh, to ever lose sight of that is uh, naive. And dangerous. It's a momentum towards hardship and being humbled. 
but to pull back and to say, Lord, thank you so much for the men and the women that invested, when I frame it personally, um, in my coming to know him and coming to follow him. I'm so grateful for that. I challenge you to contemplate who is it in your life that God used to bring you to him? Was it somebody in ministry? Was it a mom? Was it a dad? Was it a grandparent? Was it a friend? Who was it? You should brag on the Lord for them. That he entrusted them to you, entrusted you to them. Who is it that discipled you along the way and created any measure of hunger for knowing his word or knowing him or knowing his presence? That's not something that you generated on your own, most likely. And you should thank God for them. If it's uh, somebody that took time to invest in your discipleship or invest in your faith, to pray with you, to walk with you, to encourage you, to counsel you, you should thank the Lord for them. I want to give you a little bit of assignment this week. If somebody comes to mind and they're still with us today, they're still alive, I want you to take some time this week, and whether it be an email, whether it be a text, whether it be a phone call, send something to them. Let them know that you're grateful for the investment that they made into your life. It might come completely out of the blue for them, but let them know your time with me, your words to me. It was worth bragging about. Um... If you can't connect with them, maybe you just brag on them in prayer this week and you come before the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for giving me that man or that woman or that person, that influence in my life. It's a powerful thing. A third thing that uh, we can always brag on is other Christ followers. Um, One of the habits of the Apostle Paul was to brag on those who were following in the way of the gospel. And typically, he would brag on younger or weaker people. He wouldn't posture himself as, I'm stronger than you. You guys know that I'm stronger than you, so you brag on me. He rather would spin that, and he would brag on them. I'll give you just some examples. Uh, In Ephesians 1, he says this, uh, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. In Philippians chapter 1, he says this, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I, can I just insert right here that in his letters, he often would have to uh, rebuke at times and reprove. But he also always had encouragement. I just want you to know I'm proud of you. I want you to know I'm proud of your stand and your faith. He says this to the church in Colossae. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. He would write this to his son in the faith, Timothy. He said, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. He simply points to, you know, these younger people that are following, and he just brags on them. Can I just offer you one concept to consider? Um, If you never, ever expose yourself to an environment like a serve team or to missions work or to missionaries, or to groups, or to an environment, parachurch ministries. Uh, If you never expose yourself to other groups of people, you will find yourself having no one else to brag on. Part of the wisdom of serving, part of the wisdom of sharing and giving and supporting and attending is you get exposed to the family of God and you have people that you can brag on. You can brag on their faith and their pursuit of the Lord. We can always brag on Him. We can brag on the people that God has put in our life. And we can always look behind and say, these people that are following, I just want to brag on you, your faith and your persistence to know Him. Can I give you like kind of this, wrapping this up in a full perspective? Um, In the book of Acts, the church had started to grow immensely. More than anyone had ever, 
ever thought possible. And in Acts chapter 11, there's an interesting kind of set of things that happens. It says this in verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Now pause there. There had been this martyrdom of Stephen, and a lot of the Christians at that time scattered because of it. They went to a variety of regions, but the gospel began to grow exponentially. But they're simply just talking to Jewish folks. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now pause there. When it says a great number, you're talking about hundreds if not thousands. We're not talking about tens and twenties. Lots of people. Keep following. News of this reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem. Pause. That's interesting. So all this gets back to Jerusalem. I'll just save you the time. You can read it later if you want. Earlier in chapter 11, there's a particular individual that we read about in in Acts 11 that Peter was at the church of Jerusalem at this time. Peter would have been in the accompaniment of this announcement. Follow. And it says... And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was called and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. That would be the Apostle Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Interesting line here. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now pause here. Just this week, this was just kind of interesting to look at the totality of this. This thing is spreading exponentially. If you wanted to find the outer bands of it, you had to get on a boat and travel days. This had spread so much. And uh, these people began to be called Christians, followers of Christ. And the news of that gets all the way back to the church in Jerusalem at a time that Peter is at the church of Jerusalem. Here's why that's interesting to me. You remember how they argued and lobbied as to who was the most valuable and who was the greatest and why they felt like they had evidence to support that? Peter would have held the position, I was here first. I've been here longer than any of y'all. So I should be the greatest. And you follow this now that it's not limited to a number of people on one hand or two hands, but you have to get in boats to be able to travel to the outer bands of this. And Peter still has the same testimony. I was one of the first. To follow him. But look at where the gospel has gone now. Look at the extent of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So amazing. And what allowed that? It was not posturing. It was not bragging upon self. It was when they took on that role of that child and served. That it allowed that thing to spread like wildfire from continent to continent to continent through millennium to the point that somewhere in 2019 on a separate continent in a separate nation in a separate state in a separate city that people would gather in an environment like this declaring the same kind of thing that was declared 2,000 years ago. What's worth bragging about in your life? It's always going to be him. It's always going to be the people that God has put in your life who have poured into you to know him, to follow him. It's always going to be the people that are coming behind who are carrying that baton also, who are growing in faith, who are growing in fervor, who are learning to pray, who are learning to worship, who are learning to serve him. It's always going to be worth bragging about those things. If I brag about myself, it generates momentum towards trouble and hardship and being humbled. But if I brag about the right things, 
it becomes a beautiful thing and a sign of maturity and growth.